Hey, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us on uh, another edition of Table Talk, which is conversations about food. But it's not a cooking show. It's not a recipe show as such. Recipes may pop up. Cooking is definitely part of it. But it's sort of conversations adjacent to food, alongside food, uh, conversations that intersect with food. And it's a great pleasure to have with me here a very old friend, someone I've known for something like three decades from uh, time as flunkies in different uh, parts of the advertising industry in the same agency in Lintas, where Doc used to wander around the corridors in a suit, I mean, in, in you know, tie shirt, long trousers, but in only in his Argyle socks, shoes left somewhere or the other, which is how I uh, said that this is not the typical client servicing guy. Over time, he, you know, because misery loves company when your flunky is in doing the lowest of the low, we all hung around quite a bit. We were also in a training program together and uh, our profit centers were next door to one another. And we would frequently, you know, chats about lots of things. Doc introduced me to things like opera and books and music that I'd never heard before. And uh, I never at that point suspected that he had this food thing in him in such a big way. But uh, as it turns out, after we quit, the both of us in our own ways quit the entire advertising scene altogether. Uh, Doc became this sort of cult figure in the food uh, writing business with his column uh, in ET. The later on the podcast he's been doing, he was doing, which I believe he's not doing anymore. Uh, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, enough introduction. And Ducky, lovely to have you with us on Table Talk. Thanks, Peter. I mean, it's been great. As you said, you know, we, we have the sort of friendship where we only sort of connect every, uh, you know, two years or so. But every time we connect, it's like starting off uh, from uh, from from scratch. And and that it's amazing that we can do this, uh, you know, uh, online now. I'm in Goa, you're in Bombay. Um, and yeah, it's like picking up from, from when we, we, we were last talking. Yep. The, I mean, that's been a factor in a lot of my friendships as well over the years. I mean, I tend to be someone who's kind of okay with his own company most of the time. And I like being able to reach out every now and then. And I'm fortunate, I guess, and I have a lot of friends with whom I have a similar kind of pattern. We may not talk for a fairly long time, but when we do, it's easy enough to pick up the threads. There's enough of that, you know, the common past and the affection that remains for you to be able to do that. And that's a factor that's always happened with you. I mean it's not mattered really that we don't make the weekly call or the month, even the monthly call, uh, you know, that we forget each other's birthdays all the time because you're not, never on social media in any case. So you don't go only on social media. Yeah. You don't get the prompts. And yeah, I mean, so what, what prompted you to actually bite the bullet and get onto like Instagram? Okay. Only Instagram. Okay. That it's, it's very simple. I mean, like, um, uh, I, I, almost exactly a, a year back, I was downsized from the time uh, from, from the Economic Times. Though I have to say, um, it was happened in the best possible way because as soon as uh, I was fired, they gave me a contract to pretty much continue doing exactly what I was doing. Uh, obviously, just at a much lower cost for them, which actually suited me very well because um, I was uh, already spending half of my time in Goa, and I just stayed full time in Goa. So you know, uh, essentially, Alok, my partner, had moved to Goa. Uh, about two and a half years back because he just wanted to get away from Bombay and he wanted to get the space where he could focus on reinventing his career um, as a lawyer, but this time with a focus on animal rights and the law. Um, and Goa seemed to be a good place because it was away from Bombay. It was because a lot of interesting people in Goa, a lot of interesting things happening in, you know, Goa is it's just somehow a smaller place. So a lot more seems possible in Goa. Uh, so Alok made the move along with our dog, Shiru. And I was going back and forth like, twi you know, twice a month. I was just like people in the, the, the staff at Double M Airport were getting to recognize me, which was like getting to be a bit depressing. Um, and then I came in March for what I thought was going to be a short trip. And basically, I've never gone back to Bombay since then. I, uh, you know, now I, I work part time with the, with the Economic Times, still writing as I used to, exactly the same stuff. Um, I closed my flat remotely. I, have, I, I didn't go back to Bombay. I just moved everything down here. And, you know, life continues uh, um, uh, here in Goa. It's just that I felt that um, I needed to, uh, you know, publicize a little bit about what I was writing about a bit more. So 
I started the Instagram page under like, duress, I have to say, and I still don't update it anyway, like as much as I do, and really only exists to publicize stuff that I'm writing about. So that's the very simple answer. Yeah, I mean, uh, subtly and not so subtly, I told you to put this damn thing on your Instagram. Yeah, because I'm not going to do it. I <laughs> Anyway, yeah. let's get down to the food now. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you just like completely ignored those that part of my... Yeah, mind. totally. <laughs> totally, yeah, notice that. Yeah, so I thought we'd sort of start this off by looking at your relationship with food as such. So, uh, you know, food, children... I mean, food, children. I have no relationship no, I'm, with children. I'm saying with, with children, with little ones. Food uh, is just this thing that happens. You need it. It happens. It's provided to you, etc. But sort of oh realizing God, we're getting, what this, all Freudian now. Realizing what this entity of food is that someone has to cook it. Uh -huh. uh, so you're. What no, please. Call, I, I have, I have no, I have no such relationship with, with food, food like that. I mean, uh, my mother so, is a wonderful. Cook. memories of kitchens and food. Let's say nothing like that. My mother is a wonderful cook, but she hates cooking. She's always insisted from the beginning uh, of her marriage that she would have an outside cook. Uh, so I don't have this warm maternal memories uh, uh, of cooking. No, uh, uh, to, answer, to answer your question about why I started writing about food, it's, it's very simple. Uh, I became a journalist after I managed to escape advertising. And I think uh, all journalists, all writers are looking for ways to tell the stories, to, to, to tell stories about what they're interested in. And uh, for me, I, uh, food is just a way to tell stories about things I'm interested in. Um, I'm not actually a foodie, you know? I mean, uh, one of the problems that I have that comes with, with writing about food is that people assume that you're desperately interested in food. And I keep having to meet these people who want to have these deep, intense, you know, conversations about how to cook the perfect chicken curry or the perfect biryani or, 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 or you know, where, or where you can go. And I have zero interest in that, to be honest. Um, I have to listen very politely as people keep trying to talk about, you know, food that they find delicious and interesting, et cetera. And I'm not really interested in that, okay? I'm not even particularly interested in eating. I mean, I'm quite happy to eat Maggie noodles most days. Not that I do, but, um, uh, but um, to me, food is a way, to, as I said, to tell stories. Um, I, I found that, you know, you can, you can start conversations with anybody pretty much about food, even people who don't like food. I mean, the fact is they still have to eat. And that is something to, st to start talking with them about. I mean, like, let's take you. I mean, you out of all my friends seem to be the one person who was least interested in food. I mean, it, it had a purely functional uh, aspect to you. You always had, you always had a cook, you, you and your father. Um, and suddenly in lockdown, you suddenly open the, this, you, the, the, these groups to talk about food, ask people for recipes. And suddenly you're like a food guru. Now, uh, to me, that's a fascinating conversation. That's a fascinating shift. I mean, how has it changed you? Do you actually cook now? Yeah, see, it started out of pure necessity. I had been cooking a little bit before that, but it was very, very little experimental stuff. Started with having dug out my mother's rice cooker, which my mother had used for a little while and then put away because she was just not getting it. Yeah. Right. And staying with the old method of cooking. And then also at about the point that she got not well enough to cook on a regular basis and that's the first time we had a cook regularly in our house all the time. And our cook was also preferred the pressure cooker for rice and stuff. So I came upon this uh, rice cooker after reading, I mean, I went and searched for it after reading this piece by Roger Ebert about the crock pot. Uh, it's, it's a wonder, you do have is that, that book actually, it's, I actually have that book, uh, Roger and the Rice Cooker. And it's actually a fascinating uh, book. I mean, uh, I mean, for people who don't know about it, uh, this is a book written by Roger Ebert, the famous film critic for the Sun, for the uh, Sun Times, the Chicago Sun Times, who um, learned how to use a rice cooker simply because he found it something really useful to take along with him to random, uh, you know, for, for film festivals around the world because he could always plug it in most places and make sure he has a basic healthy meal and doesn't have to depend on stuff from outside. And then he gets cancer of the jaw or the throat or something. So he can no longer eat. I mean, he has, for the last several years of his life, he had all his food given to him through a tube. And yet he found an interest in cooking and using this rice cooker. So it's not a great cookbook, but it's actually a really interesting human cookbook, which, you know, illustrates, uh, again, what I said, uh, how people can write about food and cooking, even when they, as in Roger's case, they actually can't eat. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the trigger for me was, I mean, yes, I did read about 
I did know that part about Ebert. But the trigger for me was with the way he talked about food as being this essential life skill. And I was like, yeah, it's pretty disgraceful that I really can't cook to feed myself. So I started out uh, by just looking up a few things that you could do with a rice cooker. And I started putting this out on my Facebook, saying, here are the little experiments. And I, I, people are, if you give people an opportunity to, to help, they're always helpful. It's just my, my experience broadly. And yeah. I found a number of, every time I would do this, someone, there would be a certain amount of, uh, you know, polite applause and some lots of generous applause as well, because I was doing weird shit and they were like, okay, that was a different way to do this stuff. And a lot of people have never thought about a rice cooker as doing anything but make rice. Right. I did not make rice in that cooker for more than a year. Right. All right. I done all sorts of other stuff, but yeah. there were people then coming in and giving me advice, things to do. Mm. Uh, things I didn't know anything about. Some things I discovered before. What's like, the most most radical thing you cooked in a rice cooker? I have made that worked. That pretty okay. The, so I am uh, I'm very forgiving of my own recipes, and I'll eat anything that's there really. And I I I am incapable of throwing out food. This so is why like, you need a dog. Dogs are very useful for learning for for try uh, training cooks. So I don't know stuff like. Uh, you know, combinations of things where I done a few things, uh, you know, made a, a sort of a impromptu pulao. And I think one of my things that, which I believe was a bit of an invention where I sliced, thin sliced potatoes, wrapped them in spinach leaves, held them together with toothpicks and steamed it in the steamer tray while stuff was cooking in the rice cooker below. Right. And the leaves shrunk around it. And this was in a long winded way inspired by Patran, Patrani Machi. Right. Because I was like, the first time I did it was on an idli tray, where I did it for steamed fish and spinach leaves. Okay. Because I said, why not any other leaf? Why right. only banana leaf? Why not an edible right. leaf? Yeah. The only edible leaf I knew of that was large enough to fold something into was spinach. And right. I like spinach. Yeah. So I did it with that the first time. And then I tried it with other stuff. These were my only experiments before were things that I, a few things under supervision from my mom how to make white sauce, things like that. But otherwise, very little else. And this was when I first started doing it. And lockdown meant that I had to ask my cook to stay home for safety. No one could come right. out in any case. And I had no fundas. Okay. I did not know the basics. I could do things in a sort of cook by the numbers. But I had no basis. And there was no delivery, right? I mean, there was nothing. Uh, yeah, there was yeah. No happening. delivery, and common, I mean, even when delivery started, thanks to my insistence and not using a smartphone, yeah, that is a bit of a universe that's closed off to me. Right, 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 right. And by then, I'd also determined that I would feed myself. Right. So yes, I, there were ways around getting delivery and all that, but it was the helpfulness of people. That group essentially showed me so much about. There was a combination of that plus several friends, right. uh, Nilanjana among them, uh, a few others who all would coach me on recipes as well, tell right. me basics, and then I would go and experiment. And yeah. I mean, this is funny, you know, this actually reminds me, I mean, uh, these first days of lockdown reminded me of those days when uh, there's that week immediately after Bal Thakri died, um, because that was the nearest uh, situation I can remember, but that was a parallel in Bombay, because Everybody in Bombay knew, everybody who has been living in Bombay knew for, uh, for a long time, you know, knew that as soon as Bal Thakri died, the city was going to shut down for at least three to five days. No question about it. Everything uh, would be closed. And all of us were pretty much prepared for it, except for people who had not been living in Bombay for a long time. So, you know, there were all these uh, foreigners or recent uh, migrants to the city who got completely taken, by, you know, taken back because nothing was available, not even regular vada pao, food, food shops, delivery, nothing. And, and suddenly, you know, we found out. So I, I remember that time we found like there was a, a couple of people like that in the, in the building next to mine in Bombay. And we sort of got them over to eat. But yeah, that's an example of which, you know, why, why learning how to make at least the basics is, is important. Yes. I mean, there's some things I never quite got the hang of. I uh, chapatis okay. just got my thing. I sort of invented flambe chapatis along the way because I was trying to puff them up on the gas, and the damn things caught fire. Chapatis are, are seriously hard to make. I mean, you know, the, the, this is this this is one thing uh, uh, that, that 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 people forget about, and it's actually something I've written about relatively recently. 
um, about uh, or, or repeatedly in, 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 in different ways uh, about why, uh, you, you know, uh, the commercial chapatis have, ne have never really worked. And if people have tried, you know, Hindustan Unilever tried making uh, these sort of vacuum packed uh, chapatis, various, various people have tried. There are roti makers. There's a very expensive machine called the, the Rotimatic in, 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 in the market. And it's still nothing really, wor nothing really works. And uh, it's an interesting question of why, because on, on one level, what could be simpler than a chapati? But it's, a chapati is not a, a simple at all. And for two reasons. One is because the ingredients are so basic. Atta, water, salt, that's it. Um, but beyond that, I mean, and I think this insight really came to me from Naomi Dugweed, who uh, is amazing you know, uh, food writer and, has written, and she and her ex-husband, Jeffrey Alford, have written this, uh, this book called The Flatbread Factor, looking at flatbreads across the world and the way they're made. And I actually interviewed her, I think she's in there in one of my podcasts. Um, and she said that actually chapatis are one of the hardest things in the world to make, uh, simply because the people who have been making them, basically the mothers or the long-term long servants, etc., have been making them for like, you know, decades. And more to the point, they know how to make them exactly the way the person who's eating them wants it. And everybody wants the chapati in a slightly different way. You know, they want it slightly scorched, puffed, you know, something like this, a little bit, a little, little bit back, like that. And as Naomi said, the problem with me, learning how to make a chapati from scratch for someone is that you are competing with perfection. And perfection is not really going to be possible from a commercial like uh, 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 venture. So the, the and the, the funny effect of this is that people are actually, in my opinion, eating less chapatis because it's one product that has not been able to scale up very fast. Compare that to Italy's, which used to be this completely niche product. You know, had to know like someone, a, a Saudi, uh, you know, to, who, who would maybe make Italy's at home, etc. But the difference is Italy's can be scaled up very fast thanks to the invention of two things. First is the mechanized wet grinder which has a very interesting history of its own. It was invented, nobody knows exactly who made the, uh, uh, the mechanized wet grinder, but it was invented, the basic principle was invented somewhere in Coimbatore because there are a lot of small, uh, uh, you know, uh, small mechanical industry uh, sh shops in Coimbatore. And somebody over there started this idea of making, uh, there are a few names uh, who I can't, I can't remember the moment that I've written about this, um, have started making uh, a mechanized wet grinder. And that automatically took away the really dreary work of like, you know, grinding it, grinding it by hand. And suddenly you can make large volumes of batter really fast. And you could even start selling them, which is what happened, exactly what happened in Bombay. Um, th there was this amazing lady called Mrs. Gomti Murthy, who I interviewed many years back. She was one of the first, she, she was from South India. She got married to a Tamil guy who lived in Matunga. And as her uh, dowry, pretty much, she came with a wet grinder, one of the first wet grinders in Bombay. And she, she would make them for her family, then she'd make them for people locally. And then her, I think I remember she telling me that her husband, um, who used to work as a clerk in one of the mills, got sacked. So just to make some money, he, start, he started taking her Italy's and selling them um, you know, to, to, to people in the, in, in the mills because, you know, people in, in his office had always liked his wife's Italy. So he said, okay, fine, I'll make the Italy's and, and sell it. And he had a friend, a, a Gujarati guy, uh, who, who took the lead that, you know, it's interesting, a, a sort of very commercial Gujarati guy would make. He would say like, you know, people like Italy's, they might want to make Italy's, why don't you start selling the batter? And she started selling the, uh, she started selling the, the ready-made batter. And overnight, I mean, not overnight, but pretty soon, a whole industry developed in, 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 in Matunga, uh, selling ready-made Italy batter. You can still, her, her, her son still runs the company. It's called Gumti Murti Enterprises. There are others. There's another company called Jain and Ayer, which I think is, is a perfect name because it comes back to the Gujarati plus the, plus the South Indian uh, coming together. But now, of course, you have ID, which is from Bangalore, which is making Italy batter and, and supplying it across the country. It's become... So, so one, Italy batter has become readily available. The second was the pressure cooker, which people realized that if you took, take the, 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 the weight off the pressure cooker, you have a natural steamer. And suddenly it's become possible to make Italy's quickly to scale across India. And Italy's are now available across India. Uh, and simply because you can make them so much faster. Whereas chapatis have not been able to scale up that fast. 
So I have to say, as a as since I identify as a South Indian, as a proud South Indian, uh, this is a matter of great satisfaction to me that over time, uh, Italy's have slowly been displacing chapatis. So yeah, don't feel bad about not being able to make chapatis. Yeah, and I did uh, do a lot of Italy's because then thanks to this group and thanks to friends, I learned how to do the batter. Yeah, okay. And the Italy's were the easy part actually. And where I I think what was a turning point for me was learning about the adai. Simple mm. uh, Chengal Varian was on the group, just posted about the other, and I said, okay, let me try this. And I got it right the first time. And that sort of set off a little thing in me that said, okay, if I can do this, right. then, uh, I got ambitious and tried all the uh, variants, you know, making the Pesaritto, the Ulan Dosa, bunches of different things, made up my own. I invented a mango dosa at some point. Uh, because the tree behind my house, my neighbor's tree in the cyclone last year, huge number of mangoes fell down, too many mangoes to eat. Mm. Uh, two of my, the neighbors that I knew were out of town and I had a lot mm. of mangoes. So I parked a lot of them, oh, very cool. put them in the freezer. Stolen mangoes are always the best, right? That's what they always say. No, yeah. the, the owner of that uh, house is non-resident okay. and had no tenant there at that time. Okay. So it's everybody's, uh, whoever's House the mangoes fall into takes the mangoes. Right, right. So I invented mango dosas at that time because of the a memory of a childhood restaurant which yeah. did pineapple dosas. And if I said if, if pineapple then dosas, then why not yeah. mango? Ja jackfruit at least jackfruit dosas are have very common. I mean, so it's it's not uh, unusual. I mean, there's an interesting corollary to this uh, whole uh, Italy wet grinder story. It's another story that I wrote about about six months back, which was a real surprise to me. Uh, when I found out about it, was um, I, I have a friend who uh, makes chocolate in uh, in Chennai. Um, it's a very good company called Coco Trade. And actually, across India, uh, there's been this whole boom in artisanal chocolate, uh, you know, which is providing a really interesting, delicious alternative to the standard mass market chocolates. Uh, there are companies like Mason and Company, Naviluna, a, ho a whole bunch. Um, and I, but, and I, I was always wanting to know why, what has suddenly caused this whole boom in artisanal chocolate making. Uh, and I actually went to his, uh, 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 his factory, which is actually just a garage in his house in like uh, uh, Chennai. And the first thing I saw were these Italy grinders, uh, which were grinding uh, cacao. And I was like, what are these Italy grinders doing there? And he said, this is the great secret about artisanal chocolate that we have all learned that Italy grinders can be adapted to make artisanal chocolate. Because the thing about Italy grinders, about, uh, sorry, about chocolate, is that to make a chocolate from cocoa beans, uh, basically you have, to, you have to grind the cocoa beans very long in, in, a, sto in, in, in a stone grinder um, for, for a very long, uh, at a sort of gentle continuous speed, which is pretty much what uh, Italy grinders do. I mean, it, it, the problem is uh, uh, Italy, grind, Italy grinding, Italy marble, just needs about uh, one hour, whereas, whereas uh, cocoa beans need about like almost a day, it can take uh, um, in all. And so basically the early Italy grinder uh, would just burn out. But it, the, this whole market developed because an American guy uh, in Seattle, I think, was looking for, because this process of, of, grinding, uh, of, of grinding cocoa beans is a very laborious process. And it's one reason why, not just in India, across the world, artisanal chocolate had never really been able to take off because nobody was able to, to, to find a way to do this, this stone grinding in a cheap way. So, so high quality chocolate around the world was, was, uh, was done, it, it was done by these really big, relatively speaking, big players like Barry Kaibo or Valrona or, or people like that, who would then supply the, 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 the chocolate, the ground uh, chocolate mass to chocolatiers who would then make it into the final product. But the, the chocolatiers couldn't do, it, do that basic process themselves. And this guy sitting in Seattle uh, or wherever, I've forgotten his name now, uh, was just Googling for stone grinder, stone grinder. And he found stone grinder for something called Italy's. He didn't even know what Italy's were. And he got so excited, he actually got in touch with an Italy guy, uh, with some Italy wet, man, wet grinder manufacturers in Coimbatore. And most of them told them, just get lost. Who are you? Chocolate, are you crazy? But one guy was willing to listen to him and sent him an Italy grinder and work with him and, and put a higher duty, a higher, a, a, a higher value like... Uh, a, a, sorry, a, a stronger motor which would last for as long. And bit by bit, they developed a chocolate grinder from the Italy wet grinder. And these chocolate grinders from Coimbatore are now what are powering the artisanal chocolate movement, not just in India, across the world. I mean, nobody else makes them to scale. Now, because it's become so big, you have people in Russia and a few other places 
who are trying to do the same thing, but they don't have the, the expertise in making at least that we do. So in, amazingly, Coimbatore has become uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 the reasons why artisanal chocolate is booming across the world. So, I, I mean, I'm telling you this because this is partly how, how I like to, what I find fascinating about writing stories uh, about food, because when you look at it and you look at, the, at what is happening behind uh, and what is involved in the production and, and the, uh, of food, uh, you find so many links. Everything, things link to each other. Things have unexpected consequences. Who would have assumed? Who would have imagined that you know uh, some guy in Coimbatore finding a way to mechanize uh, 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 wet grinding to take a, you know reduce the pressure on his mother would end up with 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 fueling an artisanal chocolate boom across the world? But that's what's fascinating about writing about food. When did the first uh, mechanical uh, grinders come in? Sometime in the 1960s. Um, uh, I, there is a, there's actually a guy who's written a book about this. It's unfortunately it's in Tamil, so I haven't been able to get all the details. So I did interview him. I mean, if anybody's interested, it's all there in my story about chocolate grinders. I can send it to whoever's uh, uh, in, in, interested. So with the, the food research bait and just stepping back into the problem itself, was it a difficult sell to in India's largest uh, you know business newspaper to? get a column like this which is so you know the space to do this kind of thing which is a pretty whimsical it goes off in different directions it has a, at best a tangential uh you know kind of thing with business i mean if you look at like right. say you look at how how is the artisanal chocolate uh boom being fueled but i'm sure well, that's not it, the it, question it, that it started off it with be, but i mean oh, actually that story is an example of a, of, a, of a business story because actually it is a bit has become uh, it's become an unexpected business for the Coimbatore uh, people um i will say i'm i am grateful for the economic times because uh, they gave me a lot of freedom uh, to 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 write about stories and develop stories as as, as, as i like um and um, it, it also fitted my sort of interests of looking at at production at, at, at manufacturing, at, uh, at things that are part, that are important in the business world, but are often thought of as boring in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the food business, but are actually really important uh, for, for, uh, to define the food that we eat. For example, um, some of my most interesting stories I got, and this, this could only come from being in a business newspaper, from our commodity markets editors. Now, commodity markets, even within business journalism is seen as the dullest of dull. Uh, dull uh, it doesn't have the drama of the, it doesn't have the money-making scenes of, 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 the, of the markets. Commodity editors are just, there are just a few of them and uh, you commodity journalists and they exist in a little bubble of their own and basically nobody's interested in, in, in their stuff, but they have to produce commodity news every like uh, so uh, now and then. And, um, but we, I was lucky actually in that I had a, uh, we had a commodities editor who actually was really interested in, looking at wider stuff. And she cued me on to uh, a lot of interesting stories in the commodities world. And the thing about commodity stories is that they are incredibly important because they govern what you eat. Uh, the whole world of the commodities industry is critical because what we eat, the prices at which we eat, the consequences, the cost at which this food is sourced, the consequences of trade and production, all are caught up in the commodities world. And it's a very interesting secretive world um, that is not much written about because they don't want you to write about it. Uh, though if anybody's interested, there's an excellent book that came out last year called The World for Sale, which looks at the, com the commodities industry. Um, it's one of the few books that has really tried to like look at the commodities industry in detail. And the guys who wrote it, you know, write over there that the commodities people did not want them to write the book. They was like, don't write about us. We don't like to be written about. But commodities, like, the basic things about like soybeans or wheat or thing like that is what really govern what we eat. Um, and that is actually interesting for a business paper. So uh, for, for me, the, 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 the stories were there. I just had to find a way to make them interesting for a wider audience, which is what uh, being a journalist is about. But it affects things so much. I mean, I'll give you just one example because this is something uh, I'm really interested in now. And uh, it's a story that came from uh, uh, Nidhi Nath Sawant, my, the commodities editor I was working with. She wrote one. She wrote a, a couple of stories about the importance of, of yellow peas and how yellow peas were going to become a really important commodity. And 
even I, even though I was interested in her work, I was like, Nidhi, yellow peas? I mean, give me a, give me a break. I mean, like, what's so interesting about yellow peas? And, but then I, I took my cue from her and I started researching more. And I, it's a, I, yellow peas are fascinating. Now, I, I don't know if you know what yellow peas are to start with, okay? You've eaten them, but you don't realize it. Yellow peas, I mean, you can go to any large Kirana shop and you'll find them usually, they, they're called Vatana or dried Vatana. Um, and they are like little round, yellow, yellow, white, yellow, brown, yellow uh, balls. Um, and nobody thinks much about them. Nobody consciously cooks them, but they're incredibly important. And they're going to become incredibly more important uh, as, time, uh, as, as time goes on uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, yellow peas are one of the few pulse crops that grow in temperate climates, okay? Many other of the pulses that we eat are warm, uh, like, you know, moong or urad and all, turdal, etc., are, are from warmer climates. Yellow peas are one of the few uh, things that grow in colder climates. And you actually probably know this without realizing it, because the, you remember that old nursery rhyme, peas pudding, hot peas pudding, cold peas pudding in the pot, uh, nine days old. That's actually a, 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 a reminder of yellow peas, because... In past centuries, yellow peas were one of the few sort of legume crops, uh, pulse crops that were, were grown in colder climates. And one of the few sources of plant-based nutrition, which was available for, uh, for, for people, especially through like winter months when nothing else was available. So poor people often you know, ended up eating yellow peas cooked into a sort of porridge, which was inc incredibly dull. And that's, which is why the, 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 the nursery rhyme. Um, so, that's one thing, okay? But it was never a big market in India because we, of course, have all our range of like dals and pulses and, 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 uh, and, and things like that. Yellow peas started being adapted to the Indian diet because of colonialism. Uh, the British took indentured labor from India to the Caribbean mostly um, as, as cheap labor for the, for the sugar plantations once uh, the slavery was ended in, in, in the Caribbean. Uh, and, in, and, Indian, and Indian labor was taken to the place of, of the slaves. Um, and one of the big advantages of Indian labor, of, of indentured labor, was that the British thought that Indians were cheap to feed, okay? Because this, this myth grew that, you know, Indians mostly eat dals for pulses. We don't have to bother about finding expensive sources of meat for them. Um, so uh, we, we can get them with, 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 with pulses. Uh, of course, once they actually got the indentured labor, to the Caribbean, they realized the pulses weren't there because the Caribbean was not re really growing beans in a way. There were beans grown uh, in, 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 the, in, in the Americas, but not on the scale that the, uh, the, not on the, scale that the, the indentured labor re required. But then suddenly some colonial office said, hey, wait a minute, we have a source of pulses in a country that also happens to be a colony called Canada, because there's Canada, temperate country, huge pra prairies, and they are growing yellow peas. They were growing it anyway for two reasons. One is as a crop to feed animals, uh, uh, livestock over, over, uh, over winters. And secondly, as a rotational crop uh, with wheat, because uh, the thing about peas is that uh, if you remember your, your, your botany from school, they restore nutrition to the soil because uh, peas are nitrogen fixing. So simply as a, as a matter of farming, pea, uh, you know, yellow peas were one crop that were grown in, in, in the prairies in about uh, th uh, three or four uh, crop uh, 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 cycle with, with, with wheat. So there was all this yellow peas up there being grown for like, uh, uh, being grown for cattle basically. And some colonial officers said, well, okay, let's bring them down from Canada to the Caribbean and feed them to the indentured labor. So actually, if you look at, at West Indian, Indian recipes from a place like Trinidad or something like that, all of that uses yellow peas. Very few other like, uh, none of the, none of the uh, pulses that we're used to in India. So that's in the West Indies. Again, yellow peas were never a big thing in India until uh, about the 1960s, until the 1970s or 1980s, when suddenly you know, demand for food uh, grow, uh, skyrockets in India. And because of the green revolution, we have new sources of grains. Okay, we have wheat and we have rice. We don't have pulses because pulses were never affected by the green revolution, mainly because pulses are not important to people outside India. Only Indians really eat pulses. It's only in India that pulses are as important for our nutrition as they are, uh, uh, rather than anywhere else in the world. And the government has also never in, uh, invested in pulses. So suddenly there was this huge demand for dals in India, and we just didn't have we just didn't have the uh, the so there's the supply of dals. So 
uh, two things start happening. One is the Indian government desperately starts looking for other sources of pulses. Uh, we go to Australia, we go to Canada, uh, Australia in particular, and try and get them to grow pulses for us. And the, the problem is the Australians say that, you know, we'll grow pulses for you, uh, but uh, you have to have long-term contracts and the Indian government is incapable of doing long-term contracts. They always, everything is done at the last minute. Uh, the other place they go to for pulses is Burma, and people don't realize this, that many of our pulses like Turdal and Chana is actually go grown in Burma, which is one reason why the Indian government keeps its mouth shut about uh, human rights abuses in Burma, because they, we depend on, on the Burmese to grow pulses for us. But the final solution is, they say, okay, there are these pulses which are being consumed by Indians in the Caribbean called yellow peas, let's get the yellow peas here. And so the government starts getting yellow peas. Of course, the Can Canadians are only too happy to help us. There's a full lobbying organization in, uh, in Delhi called Pulse Canada, which is, which is involved in supplying pulses, uh, yellow peas for us. And slowly yellow peas start entering the Indian market by substituting chana. We don't realize this, but most of the basin that we eat is not from chana. Most of us think basin is produced from, ch from, from, from chana, chickpeas. It's not, it's produced from yellow peas which are related to chickpeas, but they're not the same thing. If you have eaten sambar in, a, in any you know, a big a South Indian restaurant, uh, you are eating yellow peas. Sambar is supposed to be made with thur dal. Nobody in the, inst in the catering, in the, in the, in the institutional uh, 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 restaurant world makes, makes sambar with, uh, with thur dal any longer because thur dal is too expensive. Everybody uses yellow peas. Bit by bit, yellow peas have entered our diets without our, us even realizing it. Um, and all this is, is, well, it's not fine. It's, it's just the way, the, the, the way it is. But it's actually now going to get even more interesting for, 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 for one reason. Because up, to, up, 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 up until now, only the Indians were interested in yellow peas for human consumption. But now suddenly there's this huge interest in plant-based foods. You have all these companies like Beyond Meat, Impossible uh, Burger, things like that. Uh, trying to innovate in plant-based foods uh, for various reasons, because they're interested in vegan issues, because in, in environmental issues, because animal rights issues, and it's a huge and growing market. Many of these companies are using pea protein, which is derived from, from yellow peas, because the Canadians uh, discovered at some point in the 1980s how to isolate pea protein uh, from, uh, from yellow peas. And uh, nobody actually was interested in this, except for some reason, vegan bodybuilders, vegetarian bodybuilders. They were the ones who discovered uh, uh, yellow peas because they, you know, they were not bodybuilders. If you know this thing, you know, need, need protein. So the common source of protein for them is whey protein. But vegan bodybuilders um, can't eat whey, uh, whey, uh, whey protein because it's from milk. So suddenly they discovered there was this thing called pea protein from, uh, uh, from, from uh, yellow peas. And actually today, if you go to any supplement store, or any bodybuilding shop, you will see these huge canisters that says, say, pea protein, which is from, from yellow peas. So this discovery, which vegan bodybuilders did, has been taken up by all these venture capitalists in the, uh, in, in the US who are, de who are developing plant-based products. And that is now one of the critical inputs for all this huge range of plant-based meats. Um, and so actually the Indian government is going to find it a bit tough now because there's suddenly uh, people looking for, you know, eyeing those yellow peas. And Canada, you know, is actually becoming like the Saudi Arabia of yellow peas. It's going to become one of the most profitable products. Now, all I'm saying is this is a story that I've developed over many years, uh, writing about it several times in different avatars. And it all started from a, a simple story that one of my commodities editors told me about. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, have I lost you at this point? <laughs> no, totally. Mm -hmm. okay. Many tangents that I could have uh, Many tangents. And, and to me, that's what's interesting about writing but where our food comes from, because it goes off in all these di 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 directions, you know, colonialism, international, uh, you know, vegan bodybuilders, uh, things like that, so many sort of things. But it all comes together in something all of you have eaten, in the sambar that you're eating from your, uh, from your neighboring South Indian shop. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, mean, sir, I was just thinking that, yeah, you know, a lot of my story ideas when I was in Forbes came. I, my original thing there was about being surrounded by business journalists who I presumed would be very focused on that. And I found business journalists had this fascinating number of interests and their desire to look at what made things viable in many ways, Absolutely. the ways they intersected was the root of so many stories. Absolutely. 
And I'm also remembering uh, relatively recently, I don't know if Georgia is here, a friend of mine from uh, Trinidad, was talking about the double in- oh. Which all, uses, which all uses yellow peas. Yes. Yellow peas and basically yeah. a distant relative of Chana Batura. Yeah. But, you know, that has evolved in a different direction. Yeah. I, I spent three hours looking at the connections there and the double king who was this guy who started this business and then went off to Canada and started a chain and then went back to reclaim the family business. And the fascinating, just from one remark which he put in in the course of something that she was writing, which she said, this is a double. And I said, what the heck is a double? And she explained, and then I went looking it up. But, but yeah, so how, Doc, to, and I know there's some young writers in here as well. How do you go about the research? How do you go about, uh, I mean, being with Bennett Coleman with the level of archives that they have obviously helps. It, to helps, to, it helps to some extent. It gives but you an how idea. How do you go about researching yeah. stuff? I mean, the, being able, able to access the, the Times of India archives helps because you have this uh, newspaper that goes back to 1838. Um, and if you have the patience to deal with uh, the, the, the software that, uh, that allows you to search it, um, you can find interesting you can, can find interesting stuff. But, uh, you know, even if you don't have access to the Times archives, there, there are many ways uh, in, 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 which you can, uh, in which you can access stuff. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and this is, I th and I think to some extent, if I made able to make a difference, this is where my background as a journalist helped. Because as a journalist, you're, you're taught, you're, you learn how to look at different sources of, of, of uh, uh, information. Um, and there is actually a lot. I mean, uh, you know, in places you don't always realize about. Um, for instance, any, anything that deals with agriculture or, or, or the production of food, uh, most people don't realize that India has this incredible network of agricultural research organizations. It all comes under the Indian Council of Agricultural Research. And if you go to, to the website and you look, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, under the sort of institutes under the Indian Center for Agricultural Research, you will find an institute for pretty much almost anything you can think about. Um, I mean, from the more obvious ones like, uh, you know, bananas and potatoes and uh, things like that. I mean, two really obscure. I mean, the, the one that I always liked was actually one that if, you, if you're ever in Bangalore on your way to the airport, you'll see on the on the side, it says the Indian Institute for Biological Use Useful Insects, um, you know, and there are there are institutes for everything. Now, they're there and each institute has its website. And if you look at it, many of them have listed the uh, have listed the, 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 the stuff that their scientists are working on. And if you have the patience to go through it, you can often find really interesting papers. You can write to them, and they, they don't all. The scientists don't always respond, but sometimes they do, um, and uh, sometimes they're really happy that people are taking interest in in in, 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 in their sub in, the, in their subjects. And uh, you can get fascinating information uh, about how things are actually made. Um, so otherwise, you know, you you just have to look up records, data. Um, you know, for instance, today. I wrote a story about rum, which is partly why I'm, I'm, I'm drinking rum. And uh, because yesterday apparently was something called World Rum Day. So actually I, I was involved in a Zoom seminar uh, on Friday about, um, uh, about uh, rum and, and Indian rum, because um, you know, just like gin has taken off in, in a big way in recent years with all these craft gins, et cetera, that is starting to happen now with rum. So there are people launching uh, you know, niche rums, artisanal rums, uh, which are very different from the sort of old monk and celebration rums that many, many people uh, grew up drinking. And um, it's an inter they, they, these guys are going to have an interesting challenge because, you know, like for most people, rum is the entry level spirit that they, that they drink, but they really move on beyond that. So either they stick loyally to old monk, we will drink old monk till we die. And we all know people like that. Or uh, they, they like, oh my God, I have all these horrible memories of getting plastered on Old Monk as a, uh, when I was uh, 20 years old and never again. And it's very, it's very hard, um, uh, you know, uh, getting that story. <laughs> yeah. So, but actually there are people now launching really good quality rums, which are, which taste nothing like Old Monk. Okay. They're, they're like miles apart. Um, and I was asked to take part in this, uh, in, in this uh, uh, talk on, on rum. And uh, that actually prompted me to do some research into rum because uh, there's a lot that's actually interesting about, uh, about rum. For one thing, Indians drink more rum than anybody else in the world. Um, but uh, uh, our rum consumption is actually declining. 
uh, quite rapidly, in fact. Even for all those people who, you know, think they're old monk till I die, actually, most of them are dying out, clearly, because old, young people aren't drinking old monk, which does not surprise me because old monk is sort of disgusting. I mean, it's maybe it's fine when you're like, oh, you know, when you're a, a, a young student and it's your entry level drink. And yeah, sure, there's a certain level of nostalgia attached to it, but man, it's so caramelly sweet. Uh, and it's not even really rum because it's 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 industrial alcohol which is flavored in different ways. That's why it's so cheap. Anyway, um, but 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 I, I was I was I lots of hearts with that one. Yeah, but I was curious about how we we started drinking rum in 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 in, in such a big way. So I'm just I'm just giving you an example of something I've researched really recently. Um, and I and now the thing about rum is that it's the one reason why rum is so cheap. Is that it's made from molasses, okay? And molasses is a byproduct uh, of sugar refining. So automatically, it's going to be one of the cheapest spirits around. Because if you're making whiskey, if you're making gin, if, even if you're making something like vodka, you're using grain or potatoes, and it's a primary ingredient. Whereas, uh, so th there's, it's in a sense, it's a higher value. Whereas with rum, your primary ingredient is molasses, which is already a byproduct. Um, so it's going to be cheaper. So that's one reason why rum is one of the cheapest spirits in. Uh, 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 anywhere in, uh, in, in, the, in, in the world. But, and also, I knew that sugarcane was first domesticated for use in India. That's, that's very well established by bioanthropology and by Indian texts, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but there are reference, now, if you, if, now if, you if you grind sugarcane, you get sugarcane juice. Sugarcane juice uh, ferments really rapidly, uh, really rapidly. So people would have ha put it, people would have been fami familiar with fermented sugarcane juice. Whether they distilled it is harder to say. There are references to uh, something that could have been a distillate of sugarcane juice in Sanskrit texts, but it never became a big thing. Um, and one reason why it probably never became a big thing is because when we eat sugar traditionally in India, we don't eat crystallized sugar, we eat jaggery. So we boil down the sugar to make jaggery, but we don't. We never used to crystallize sugar, um, and so we weren't making molasses. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the rum industry in India, and this is this is well established, really only starts with the British uh, mm -hmm. in 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 the in the late uh, 18th century when they start they establish the first sugar refining factories in Bengal and parts of and parts of what are now Bihar to refine sugar and make crystallized sugar, partly because that's what they wanted to eat, and partly because there was a market for sugar in uh, crystallized sugar uh, in the UK. And so molasses, molasses started being produced as a, as a byproduct. And at some point, uh, uh, the, 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 they started using the molasses to make rum. Now, I had always assumed that this rum was produced for the consumption of British soldiers and sailors, mm -hmm. uh, because that was, that was a big market. But this was not actually 100% clear. And, uh, and I always thought there was a bit of a lacuna here, because the British, by and large, and this is how imperial logic works, they want everything to go through the UK. Um, and the huge amounts of rum were being made in the Caribbean, which was the main source of sugar uh, for, for, uh, uh, for the British, hence the indentured workers that we were talking about uh, earlier. So, so most British rum consumed by the Navy in particular came from the Caribbean, from the West Indies. Um, so I was curious about where this, uh, where this rum, so I did some research and actually very soon the pieces fell, fell together. Uh, partly, as I said, you can go online to things like parliament, UK parliamentary debates, and I found a fascinating, uh, you know, a report from the from a, from a parliamentary select committee in 1840. All of which is available online, okay, uh, uh, through Hansard or things like that, talking about East India products. Now, the answer to my question is actually really simple and rather surprising. Uh, Indian rum started being produced for Australia. Uh, because in in yeah in 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 uh, in 1888 the first penal colony is, is established in Australia. Uh, the first what they call the first fleet reach, reaches Australia with criminals and destitutes from, from from the UK. One big reason why Australia is developed as a penal colony is because of American independence. Because after independence, the Americans say you know you can't keep sending us all the trash from the UK. You, you, so a new place is needed. Australia being was, was then developed. So what that meant is Australia was suddenly this colony uh, full of sailors because you needed ships to reach Australia, and the the destitute and you know, and the poorest people from from the uh, from UK who all drank like crazy and were desperate for something to drink, and which meant rum. 
So the, the, one of the big things in the colony in the earliest, uh, you know, first 30 years of Australia was finding sources of alcohol. Uh, alcohol was so important in Australia that it was, all, it was used as a currency. Uh, you know, you could buy land, you could buy sheep with, 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 with alcohol, but they needed rum. And the main source of rum, as I said, was in the, was in the West Indies, uh, which is almost literally on the other side of, of the globe from, from Australia. So the, the, uh, the new Australian colony desperately started looking for new sources of rum. They got some of it from Brazil, what's called cachaça. But if you know, that's, if you've ever drunk cachaça, that's, cachaça is, made, is what's called a rum agricole. It's made from, from a distilled fermented sugarcane juice, not from molasses. So it's this very potent, very fiery spirit. It's great for caipirinhas and things like that. Um, but it's not rum as we think about it, though it is technically a rum because it is made from sugarcane. Um, there is actually a, a guy in India, uh, in Goa, Desmond G, who makes what he calls cane spirit. Uh, which is uh, which is really worth trying. It's pretty cool it, because it is India's one uh, rum agricole kachas, uh, kachas, uh, kachasa equivalent. But as I said, it's not rum and it's pretty fiery. Um, so people didn't like that very much. Uh, the other source of another source of, of rum was Batavia, which is now Java, which again produced a kind of uh, uh, rum spirit, though mixed for some reason with with rice, uh, which you can still buy. It's called Batavia Arak. But the, what the, the what was seen as the premium product, the best product, was, was what they call Bengal rum. For, so for almost 30 years, Bengal rum was hugely important to Australia. It was like almost a currency. It was like, you know, something that was prized and really, uh, th and, and to supply Australia, distilleries were set up in Bengal and Bihar. This lasts about 30 years until the Australians finally discover that they can, they can grow sugarcane in Queensland and start distilling, uh, distilling alcohol for themselves. So obviously, why do they have, there's an interesting quote uh, from one of these things, like why did this poor colony of Australia have to enrich the rich merchants of, of, of Calcutta, which is an interesting uh, sort of in, 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 inversion. So at that point, um, they, they stop, uh, they stop uh, uh, making, you know, importing rum from India. Um, and, but the distilleries are there. And so then they start, so they start supplying rum uh, throughout uh, through, through other parts of the world. And um, this, so in this parliamentary select committee report that I discovered from 1840, there's a very interesting discuss discussion on rum, which is fascinating because it has methods of production. It has, you know, uh, costs, it has, everything you want really is, is there. And one of the guys uh, says that, and this is really interesting. He says that, you know, these, these Indian distilleries are actually now making really good quality rum because some of them are even experimenting. They are, making rum not from molasses, but actually from jaggery. Because you can make rum from jaggery. You have to dissolve jaggery in water and ferment it. And you get a very interesting, actually rather superior rum. And this guy in 1840, uh, who's actually a West Indian merchant, so he knows his rum. He's saying that this Indian rum is so good that if, you, uh, if we allow it into the UK, it's going to destroy our spirits industry. Um, so he's actually arguing for it. So the, the parliamentary committee actually decides not to allow Indian rum into the UK, except at a very high level of duty, which effectively kills off this potential market for high quality Indian rum uh, uh, to the UK. But the, the technology is there, the know-how is there, and at least molasses-based rum continues to be produced in India. Uh, at some point, a, a, a guy called Edward Dyer uh, starts making it, and uh, Edward Dyer, who we know, unfortunately, as the grandfather of Reginald Dyer, the, 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 the general of Jalian Wallabag, uh, actually sets up this company called Dyer Meakin, uh, which, or, which actually ultimately produced Old Mark. Obviously, post Jalian Malabag, it was not a good edit for, for it to continue to be called Daya Meekin. So at some point it's sold and it becomes Mohan Meekin. But uh, people often don't realize there's this, this connection between Jalian Malabag and, and Old Mark. Um, so that's how we got our huge industry of molasses derived rum. But what's really interesting about the guys who are doing artisanal rum today is that they are now experimenting in the way those people way back in the early 19th century we're doing. So in fact, the rum that I'm drinking is, uh, is this. I mean, I'm not being, this is not a commercial endorsement. Nobody's paying me for this, but it's, this is a, this is a it's, it's, I don't think you can see it. It's called Amrut uh, 2 in these rum. Um, and uh, it's produced by, from Bangalore. And this is actually a jaggery based rum. For the mm -hmm. first time after about almost 150 years, uh, an Indian company is making a jaggery based rum. And it's miles different from uh, from uh, the sort of rum that was uh, was being, uh, pr uh, you know, pr produced uh, like Old Monk and, and Celebration and all the other brands. 
Um, so as I said, the data is there. You just have to go out and look for it and have a sort of imaginative idea of what to look for. So where the Amrit is uh, the same guys who do the single malts, right? They do the single malts also. This is they actually started doing this about six years back uh, because they actually lobbied with the Karnataka government to allow them to make uh, rums out of jaggery because otherwise, uh, as per the excise rules, you could only make rum out of molasses. Um, and but they got them to change the, the rules and they actually started making this uh, rum out of jaggery. And as I said, it's excellent. It's available in Bombay. Try it. Mm. In fact, uh, Desmond, I'm not. I'm not being paid for this endorsement. Desmond G. Skane Spirit. I'm not being paid for this either. Desmond G. Skane Spirit uh, was actually got me through a month of lockdown. Oh, yeah. wonderful! Really? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah it's, it's very good actually. I mean, in in a certain sort of fiery way, you you need something to balance out that sort of uh, really strong taste. But um, it's excellent. I, I I don't know why Desmond doesn't promote it more, but uh, he should. Anyway. And get it out of Goa uh, because I met him and had a long chat and I picked up uh, the Mahua and the Mahua liqueur, liqueur. See, Desmond is obsessed with this damn Mahua of his, okay? Uh, and it's a great story, etc. It's still disgusting. Um, I, I, I don't know why he wants That's to keep it. This, you like the idea of Mahua, but his, no, no, no. his Mahua spirit is really pretty crap and his cane spirit is pretty good and God knows why he's not promoting, but that's his prerogative. There's a lot of interesting stuff happening in booze in Goa, particularly. Why yeah. do you think that is? That there's so much innovation in barring Amrut when they came out with a single malt, which suddenly told the world that you could get this really excellent whiskey that was made in India. I mean, there's a uh, lot of innovation has happened in Goa, and why do you think there's a lot is? of interesting food and uh, drink stuff happening in Goa? Which is why, honestly, I've been it's been wonderful for me moving to Goa, uh, you know, in 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 uh, in lockdown. Um, because um, I think that there are, there are multiple reasons for it. Uh, one is it's a small state um, and it's actually just easier to get things done in a small state. I mean, you can, you know, bureaucrats are much more accessible in a place like Goa than they're, than they're in a place like uh, 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 Maharashtra. Obviously, tourism is a huge thing. You say anything is, 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 would help tourism and automatically you get a permit uh, 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 for, for, for almost anything. Um, and the, the fact is that uh, for better or for worse, tourism brings in a totally new kind of consumer base uh, uh, to Goa. So, you know, Goa does not depend only on Goans of, as, as, as consumers. Um, so uh, alcohol obviously is, is deeply uh, linked to, to Goa. Um, this is the one, one place I've seen where booze shops open before Kirana shops. Um, and, uh, you know, getting alcohol was never a problem, even in lockdown. It was, you know, if nothing else, you could get Urak because it's in summer because it was the Urak season. Um, and, uh, and so the government has been pretty cool about like uh, granting uh, licenses for, for alcohol, uh, for alcohol development. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's made it easier to make high end alcohol because the problem in India is that because we have this weird relation to al alcohol, we make it really difficult to make a high quality alcohol. Uh, we make it very easy to make really cheap uh, mass market alcohol, which actually ends up screwing people much more than good high quality alcohol drunk in small amounts. Um, Goa luckily uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't believe in this. Uh, it, it has encouraged the development of high quality um, uh, alcohol, which, which is sold at a much cheaper price. I mean, uh, for, you know, you're, you're not going to bankrupt yourself uh, buying something reasonably good quality. Um, so, so that's one. I mean, uh, uh, I think also Goa, and this has been a wonderful learning for me. Well, two things. One is you have a lot of interesting people in Goa from around the world who have brought lots of fascinating uh, techniques and food development stuff um, uh, to Goa from a long time back. I mean, some of it is the legacy of the hippies. Some of it is the Russians. I mean, uh, you know, Russians who make amazing Russian cakes and, uh, 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 and pickles and things over here. Um, so all these people from around the world are coming here and food is always for anybody who's an immigrant, anybody who's come trying to make a quick buck, you know, at, 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 at some time, food is always the easiest thing to start uh, making and, and, and selling. So you have the producers, you have a fairly sophisticated consumer base. You also have a state that is still agricultural, you know, um, and this actually was a really important learning from lockdown, from the first lockdown in particular, uh, you know, when state borders were closed. Suddenly, uh, Goa woke up to the fact that so much of its food has now coming from outside Goa. Most of our vegetables come from Karnataka. Most of our grains come from Maharashtra. 
a lot of the fish actually now comes from the East Coast. Um, and I think the first lockdown was a real wake up call for a lot of Goans to how fragile their food systems have become in a state that partly because it was this little isolated enclave away from the, uh, uh, you know, a, a Portuguese enclave, uh, had actually developed a, a fairly uh, self, self-sustaining uh, food culture, not, en- not entirely felt self-sustaining because, you know, for instance, all the wheat that Goa ate did come from Punjab and Karachi and places like that. Um, but Goa was relatively self-sustaining. And uh, the first lockdown was a wake-up call about how Goa needs to rediscover its old traditions of food production and food consumption um, and, uh, you know, become more self-sustaining. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and people, were, were, people were coming, people were discovering things like, you know, the local Goan uh, beans, alsande, which is what you call lobia, which is one bean that grows, grows in Goa. And uh, things like that were, were, were produced uh, in, in large quantities. Uh, people started looking, one of the best examples I, I find is that people realized that there were food sources on the trees because uh, the, 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 as it happens, uh, March uh, and April, when the first lockdown happened, was when the first jackfruit trees uh, were, 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 were coming into fruit. And, and suddenly people realized, oh my God, my grandmothers used to cook this jackfruit in, in, so, in so many ways. And yeah, I did it too in first lockdown because we had like jackfruit trees right now, garden. I mean, I I hacked down a jackfruit tree and you know covered my hands with oil and things like that and and cut a green jackfruit and we cooked it like uh, like meat. Uh, but it's not just jackfruit. There's breadfruit. There are coconuts, obviously. There are so many uh, tree-based fruit products um, that we have in our gardens. I mean, I just you know, for instance, I just plucked out this because I thought this is now this. I don't know if you know you recognize uh, the, this. I mean. This, I don't know if anyone has, knows what this is. This is actually, it looks like papaya, but it's not papaya. It's what's called tree spinach. Um, it's, it's originally from Central America. It's a, it's a shrub, uh, like a small tree, uh, which grows and keeps producing these trees. These, uh, these are incredibly nutritious. They're one of the most high protein uh, sources of plant-based foods. Uh, the only slight problem with them is that you can't eat them raw. They're, they're poisonous when they're raw. So you have to boil them for about 20 minutes and then throw away the water. And then, and then they taste like spinach. Uh, it is one of the most, uh, yeah, Sangeeta, has, Sangeeta Kana has identified, it's, it's called chaya. Um, and it is one of the most useful sources of plant-based foods because, you know, you don't have to keep sowing them. Once you have a, a shrub, you just keep plucking leaves and then they come and you have to boil it. Uh, and these are the sort of, these are the sort of plants that are, that are available in, 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 in Goa because, again, Goa over centuries has been a place where products come in. It's an anthropod, right? I mean, chilies, uh, chilies are supposed to have come into India to Goa. Breadfruit, which is, uh, which is widely available in, in, in Goa, again, uh, came to Goa. So all these products are there, and that's something that has continued. Um, and I think it, was, I, it would be horrible if, the, if you know, after all the, uh, the, the, this one and a half years of, of, of lockdown that we don't, uh, you know, realize the positive lessons of, of uh, that people can have learned, have started learning uh, from, from lockdown about discovering local sources of food, alternative sources of food. And Goa is a wonderful place because it's a crucible where a lot of this is happening. So for me, it's been fascinating relocating to Goa because suddenly I'm part of all these conversations about sustainability, uh, 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 about uh, ecological balance, uh, about animal rights. I mean, you know, through, through my partner, Alok, who's, uh, who's uh, work now is entirely focused on on uh, uh, animal rights. Uh, we are we we are looking at uh, we we are increasingly looking at foods about not just vegan foods. I mean, just vegan plant based foods, uh, which which are available in Goa because people are interested in it. Um, so so yeah, I mean, Goa has been a great place for all this. Just a reminder, folks, for those of you who would like to make a little thank you for this conversation. Vikram's chosen charity is All Creatures Great and Small, which I put a link to in the uh, chat. And they also have a fundraiser on Milap, which I'm putting in. So if you can, if you can spare the funds, uh, please make a donation as a thank you for this chat. Yeah, I'll just say All Creatures Great and Small is an amazing charity. It's uh, based uh, outside uh, Delhi. It's near, it's part of Gurgaon actually. 
Uh, it's run by Anjali Gopalan, who is an incredible woman. She uh, was somebody I know actually from uh, Alok and my work on the 377 case to decriminalize homosexuality. Anjali was one of the first people in India to, uh, to open an NGO uh, for HIV positive children. Uh, she and that actually, and through a friendship with, with many uh, gay men, brought her to uh, the, the, the problems of criminalization of homosexuality. So the first uh, sustained case in India uh, in the courts uh, to decriminalize homosexuality was the Nas India petition, which was filed by Anjali, which uh, we won in 2009 in the, in the Delhi High Court. And then uh, the appeal against that was lost in the Supreme Court. And uh, that led to the final petition uh, in Navtej uh, Johar, which uh, we, we won um, a, 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 few, a, few, a few years uh, back. So Anjali has been our support um, uh, you know, through this. And among the other things she's done, Anjali is one of these amazing people who just naturally gets involved and sustains a whole bunch of things. You know, she, uh, she, has, she had an orphanage for like HIV positive kids. She had all her work for gay, for, for, uh, gay men and, and the decriminalization of homosexuality. Um, uh, and among other things, she, she started this amazing uh, farm, which is called All Creatures Get Great and Small, which, is, which accepts animals of any kind, not just dogs, not just you know, uh, cows or things like that. Any animal in distress is, uh, is accepted. She has worked out all these amazing systems. She gets like food waste from uh, many of the top uh, you know, hotels in, in, in Delhi to feed the animals, but they always need money. They always need donations. So, yeah, if you do uh, are looking for a great uh, 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 you know uh, organization to give to all creatures, great and small, is that? I'm just wondering which of the threads to pick up on, but I think I will uh, look at one which is, uh, as you you mentioned, uh, Alok's work is about animal rights. Right. And uh, one of the things I've been reading up a lot about lately, and I've been sort of putting together this this research over time hoping to do something with it is the entire thing of uh, meat and meat substitutes. Right. Because yes, there are problems with the way we get our meat. Uh, factory uh, produced meat, so to speak, and the conditions in which animals are, uh, you know, are farmed. And, but nevertheless, meat is still, when you have a population that uh, is undernourished on average, uh, meat is one very good source of concentrated protein and something that's very important. So all of the stuff that I see happening around those... How, how, much, how much meat do you eat on a regular basis? Uh, now it's maybe once a week, once in two weeks. Okay. Uh, I'd cut down my meat earlier because my folks started to eat less meat. And I said, why are you cook meat just for me? Right. Right. And then over time I was like, yeah, okay. It's, it's fine. I mean, the thing is, if you'd asked your parents, I mean, I, I, they may not have said they cut down their meat. They probably were going back to the way they grew up, which was not eating meat that often. Um, and if you talk to many older people who do eat meat, uh, they will tell you that, you know, we didn't meet, eat meat every day. Or we, I remember having this conversation with my grandmother, who was uh, Malayali and grew up in uh, Kannur. And I said, like, you know, did you eat like fish every day? And uh, she was like, no, of course we didn't eat, uh, we didn't eat big fish every day. We ate sardines very often, Nathalie, uh, things like that, small fish. But a lot of the food was like effectively vegetarian with a certain amount of small, uh, small amount of a uh, component uh, uh, of meat. And, uh, you know, this is a very difficult conversation that to be in today because, uh, and it's something that Alok and I are grappling with because you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, we have a population that needs protein. Uh, more to the problem, we are living in a country where issues about meat eating are being weaponized by politicians, uh, which is a very problematic thing because, you know, they are weaponizing meat eating for their own purposes, not because they care about animals particularly or at all, really. Uh, but they're using, uh, they, you know, they, 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 they are, they're making, uh, they're making meat eating uh, as a sign of being of moral, of, of moral failure. Um, and obviously, you know, to oppose, uh, one has to oppose this particular use. But unfortunately, I find that a lot of people then go to the other opposite. They, they, they feel that to oppose it, you have to eat a lot of meat, um, which to me is sort of daft. I mean, you, you are in a sense playing into the, into the hands of the argument too. Uh, you are not looking at the, at the issue, the food, what you eat for itself. You are letting what you eat be defined 
either for or against the political uses that food is being 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 put to. Um, and for a lot of reasons, I, I find it really interesting uh, that people who eat meat, and I, I eat meat too, um, but uh, I eat meat, very little meat like you. And actually like how most people in India eat meat. We ate, most people in India who eat meat only eat meat as a small component of the diet. Whereas today, if somehow meat eating is, is being seen as you have to eat a lot of meat. I see this in Goa all the time because people come to Goa as tourists. And for a lot of people, especially from North India, Goa is equated with beaches, meat, and booze. And so they come to Goa and they want to eat large amounts of meat. You have all these restaurants selling so-called Goan food, which serve meat, 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 which is not how Goans eat, even, 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 even Catholic Goans. I mean, a friend of mine just today you know, was, was cooking a special Catholic Goan monsoon menu for her sister's birthday. And the food was fantastic. It looked amazing. It was, there was not that much meat. There was meat was a small component in, uh, in, in the food, but there were a lot of like greens because, you know, uh, there are a lot of wild and, and cultivated greens in the fields at the moment. There were a lot of grains, there were a lot of, uh, there, there, it was a really diverse diet and meat was a small, an important part of it, but a small part of it. And it was actually a very healthy diet because, you know, you are getting the proteins, you are getting all the, 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 the complex amino acids that are hard to get from non-meat uh, sources. Uh, it's not impossible to get them, but it's, it's difficult. Um, but you are not only eating meat. Meat is not the huge component of your diet. Um, and to me, what is really interesting about the Indian diet is that this is our natural diet, that we have this huge amount of plant-based foods. We also have meat. It's not that Indians don't eat meat, but we eat meat traditionally in proportion with all these other foods. And that is a truly, uh, that is a truly healthy diet. It's a true, it is a great diet. It is an environmentally appropriate diet. Um, and uh, it, it is also a diet, you know, that minimizes because we're not, if we don't, if you don't eat that much meat, we don't need to engage in the sort of factory farming systems for meat, which, which cause incredible cruelty to animals and incredible medical problems too. I mean, again, this is something that has come up in a small way in, in COVID. I mean, one of the problems in the second round of COVID has been this issue of antibiotic use and how many antibiotics have been failing, which is why, you know, possibly diseases like black fungus and all that have, start, have, have, have started growing. And one of the main reasons why antibiotic use has been, has, is failing is because of antibiotics are being abused in the, in the factory farming industry. Now, again, people don't often understand why. They, they think it's because, you know, factory farmed animals fall sick often, so they have to be pumped full of antibiotics, which is true. That is a big reason why antibiotics are used in the factory farming industry, because the conditions animals are raised in are, are horrific. But there's an, another reason why antibiotics are used, because for reasons even today that, that physiologists don't really understand, from the 1950s onwards, it was found that, that feeding animals, particularly chickens, a high dose of antibiotics from a really early age means that they grow very fast. So antibiotics are, grow, are help with, uh, 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 as a growth booster. It's a, it's as a result of which broiler chicken is now harvested at something like three months. Okay, it go, broiler chickens grow from being tiny chicks to full bridge meaty like things in about three, three, three and a half months, simply because of antibiotic use. To me, that is sort of obscene to be honest because uh, that's a shorter than the growing period of a vegetable. Uh, to create broiler chicken, you're, you, you, know, you can create broiler chicken in less than a time for growing vegetables. It's pumped full of antibiotics, both for reasons of, of, of the diseases that they get and to promote their growth. And at the end of the day, you have a product that tastes of nothing. Uh, you know, I, I am not preachy about food. I don't, I mean, I'm like, people should eat what they want. I just, I think as a journalist, one of my duties is to make people aware of what they're eating, but then in the end, it's, it's up to your choice. Mm -hmm. And even Alok believes in this very firmly, that we cannot force people. All we can do is make people aware of the, of the facts. But if, I, if anybody asks me, should I make one change in my diet? I tell them, please try and think about not eating broiler chicken because it's incredibly cruel. It is incredibly problematic. It's leading to antibiotic use in a huge way. It's causing, uh, it's causing environmental degradation in a huge way that we can see in Goa because uh, broiler chickens 
are fed on 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 chicken on chicken meal, which is mostly based from from, from ground up and dried fish, which is a bycatch. And as a result of that, trawlers are going out and just stripping the seabed of anything. Earlier ships would go out and get only the commercially useful fish, but now because of the fish the the chicken meal industry, any living creature is useful because it's all just ground up. And as a result of which of these trawler, trawler, trawlers that are growing out and creating complete deserts here in, in the seabed. And I can see this when we go out and you talk to the fishermen on the beaches here, they will tell you like live this thing about how, uh, about how uh, they, their catches are falling, about how the composition of fish, fishes, uh, of fish are changing. And one of the main reasons of this is broiler chicken. So, you know, as I said, I don't believe in being preachy, but if you want to make one big change to a diet, please stop eating broiler chicken. And how much of a change is it? Because it tastes a fucking nothing. It's like the paneer, of, it's like the, the, you know, a tasteless paneer of like meat. I mean, if you like chicken, well, invest in desi chicken, you know, which at least tastes of something, even if it's not as meaty. Sorry, end of rant. Or like basa, which yeah. basically is, you know, soggy cardboard. It, it's similar. And again, basa is fed with fish meal, which is again based on bycatch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, my, we did eat a lot more meat than the occasional thing, Anglo family. So uh, it was actually every meal. But then my dad uh, was diagnosed with slightly high cholesterol in his uh, 40s. And we stopped. It was mainly red meat. We didn't eat. Right. Chicken was more expensive when I was growing up. And so beef was what we got. Or beef or buffalo was what we got. And that was a small part of every meal. I mean, of two meals a day. Along with grain, rice, or chapatis. And, you know, dals and stuff like that. And a vegetable and everything like that. But meat was there all the time. It was only because we stopped because my mom also developed other issues as well. And so both of them cut down their red meat and started cooking less and was being only cooked for me. So I said, why? Okay. I'll eat what everyone else is eating. Don't you have to cook anything separately for me? And I slowly started cutting down my meat from them. Also started getting more aware of what went into bringing meat to my table. Right. And which is a key thing. Yes. yes. And that was the thing there, which I have sort of, made a conscious attempts since then to even cut my meat down even further. Right, uh, right. Before that, it was just a question of, yeah, I just it's just more convenient okay. when going out. Uh, Peter, do you want to take the questions now? Because honestly, I'm going to have to leave soon. I mean, uh, Alok is already making like uh, threatening noises in the background. Um, um, so and, uh, so do you want I'll to... go with topic first, since yeah, this is sure. something that we said. So Jasmine, Jasmine Paur asks, uh, how would you guide food writing aspirants? How should they begin or start in this field? Okay, so this is a great question. And it's actually, well, you know, one thing that's important here is something that's close to your heart. Because the, 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 I think food writing in India has been revolutionized by the blogging revolution, uh, something that you got in on really early. Uh, because, you know, the problem with, with the traditional, the way in which food was written about in traditional media was it was a seen as restaurant reviewing, okay? Um, and I actually, like most uh, food writers who write food, I started off writing on restaurants, but I got really bored about it because uh, there's really that much you can say about, re about most, uh, most restaurants. And um, uh, so I stopped and I started looking at, uh, at other issues about food, which is what led me to uh, what I got about. But it's true, you know, in, in, in mainstream media, traditionally, it was very hard getting food writing that was not about restaurants or now and then you'd have a bit of few nostalgia pieces and, 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 and things like that. Uh, but it was very mainstream. And what happened when I think the, 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 the blogging sort of revolution happened, it empowered a lot of people to start writing about the food that, that they ate at home, that they were interested in, and that was not being reflected in the sort of stories that were appearing in, in mainstream media. And so you had these amazing voices coming up uh, 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 through, through, uh, directly through the net. I mean, uh, Rushina Munshaw, who's part of this, who was one of the audiences, a friend of mine who again uh, came up as, as a blogger. You know, she, she, she wrote a blog uh, that led her to develop her into interest in food. Uh, she wrote, she's written cookbooks now. She's run a food studio. She's one of the most dynamic voices in, uh, in, in chronicling uh, Indian, Indian food today. And it came through, in, in, in came through uh, blogging. And there are a whole bunch of, uh, of, of people who have, who, who have come, up, uh, uh, come up that way. Um, and I think uh, what has happened in the last few years is uh, the, now we have, we have online magazines like Whetstone and Bittles and yes. a whole sort of thing who are, who are writing about food 
uh, in, in, in really interesting and dynamic, uh, in dynamic ways. So uh, I think uh, there is a lot of scope for, for food writers today. Um, the ways to start is, I said, you know, look at the food that you're familiar with. Look at the food that, that you eat regularly. Look at the food that you're seeing being eaten on the, on the streets in front of you. Some of my most interesting stories have come from walking the streets in Mumbai or here in Goa um, and looking at, at street food because street food is a source of huge innovation. Um, and you come up with things like, I mean, I wrote, I've written, for instance, in Bombay about um, Chinese bail, for instance. Have you, have you eaten Chinese bail? Okay, so now Chinese bail, for those of people who are not in Bombay, is a dish that actually came up completely from the streets. What it is, is actually cabbage. It's, it's cabbage, uh, bangobi, one of the cheapest vegetables in the, in, in, uh, in the market, which is tossed and sort of lightly stir fried with a very chatpata shezwan sauce and some, uh, and some sort of like kurkure on top. And that's Chinese bail. And it's actually fascinating because for a number of reasons, because A, um, it's actually a salad. If you look at it, it's a warm salad. We don't know, and you know, we, we often hear like, where are the salads in Indian food? Well, hey, hello, Chinese bail is a salad, right? Uh, right in front of you. It's also a use of cabbage, um, which is not native to India, but I personally feel that Indians cook cabbage better than almost most people in the world because cabbage is a vegetable that really takes to long, slow cooking that absorbs spices really well. Um, and uh, for the one thing I like, but you know, how many people celebrate Indian cabbage recipes? You know, I, I'm still, I can think of like hardly any restaurant except my, my old favorite, National and Bandra, which occasionally put cabbage on the menu. Nobody celebrates Indian cabbage dishes, whereas I personally think that Indians cook cabbage better than most, mo, mo, most people in the, in, 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 um, uh, in the world. Similarly, here in Goa, I'll give you an example of a fantastic street food dish uh, that was a complete surprise for me. Um, it was actually one of my, uh, a taxi driver who I use quite oftenly, often, who actually has realized I'm interested in food. So he goes out of his way uh, uh, to, to, to find, to show me interesting food things. And again, you know, the stereotype of Goa is meaty, seafood, things like that. But this is an example of how actual Goans don't really eat a lot of that stuff. Um, so he took me to, to this little place, which was, uh, and this is a, a, a food which is actually only available in North Goa. I tell people in South Goa about this and they're like, huh, what is this? It's called Daba Pao. And what it is, it's the most amazing variation on Vada Pao. Like, and to me, this is a surprise. I, I saw myself as somebody from Bombay. Nobody can tell people from Bombay what, what is, uh, yeah, how to make a better Vada Pao. And somebody in Goa has developed it because what a, a Daba Pao is, it's basically a capsicum, a green capsicum, which is sliced in half. Uh, the the seeds are taken out, the, the spicy vada pao potato mixture is put in it, and the whole thing is put in the basin batter and deep fried. So basically, it's a capsicum vada pao. It is amazing, okay, uh, because it is it adds that one element to vada pao that was somehow lacking until you've had a daba pao because it has a, there's a slightly because that deep frying doesn't overcook the cap uh, doesn't overcook the capsicum, but it takes a slightly grassy edge of the capsicum, so it's still crisp and it adds a different layer to vada pao. And as I said, this is something that has come up from the from totally from street food. So as I, so, coming back to what the original question is, just look at what you're actually eating, and try and find out the stories behind it. That the Baba thing I didn't, is something actually close to what my mom used to make. Yeah. Actually, hollow out the capsicum, or she also did it with brinjal, and stuffing in it, seal the top with batter, fry. And yeah. Because I couldn't stand capsicum, still can't. Uh, <laughs> she made the variant for me that she would yeah. make was with tomatoes, which was one of the things I made during lockdown as well, with a number of other stuffings as well. But yeah, uh, so as a writer, as a journalist, I'm just taking this one from Pujarini Sen, who uh, Pujarini Sen who asks about your podcast and yeah. what would persuade you to start it again. But what brought you in? I mean, at that point, you were also with ET. Yeah, and you were doing this podcast for a company that was not ET. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I, the, 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 well, the the deal with ET was uh, with the Times Group is that you can't write about anything that that they are doing because they can monetize it. But but when we started doing podcasts and when we, we said we, I'm talking about my friend Rajesh Tahil, who mm -hmm. uh, really is a pioneer of podcasting in India. Uh, Rajesh uh, used to Rajesh used to work with uh, Radio Midday, so he had a commitment. He had real fascination with radio, uh, with FM radio. And uh, when Radio Midday, when Radio Midday stopped, uh, uh, when he left Radio Midday, sorry, um, he wanted to get back into radio, into the sort of audible space 
um, and podcasting was taking off in the in the U.S. at that time. And so he had a he had a company, Hill Road Media, which was producing content for uh, other companies. Um, have you ever worked with Hill Road Media? You worked with everybody, haven't you? No, I haven't worked with Hill Road Media. Okay, I know uh, that very well. And I mean, from back in the yeah. day, we were all in Phoenix, no? Yeah, uh, so, we have talked about this too. Yeah, so so uh, so uh, Rajesh wanted to start podcasts in India, and he came to me because he's a really good friend of mine. Again, somebody I worked with in in Lintas all those years back. Um, and he said, "Well, you know, you're, you're right about food. Let's do a food podcast." And uh, but the and, and it was incredible. We were really one. You know, today everybody in the uncle has a podcast. Okay, but at that time when we started it, almost nobody had a podcast, and we had to keep telling people what a podcast is. You know, and it was like this incredibly frustrating conversation. We say people, "Yes, it's radio, but you don't. Yes, but you can actually listen to it on your phone, and you don't have to wait for a particular time uh, to we actually release the spot." On how to listen to podcasts because people just didn't realize what what podcasts were were, were at that time. Um, and the truth is, uh, the sad truth is, we were ahead of our times. Uh, we started uh, doing podcasts too early um, when there was no money in it, and uh, for various reasons to do, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, for commercial reasons, we just couldn't sustain it. Rajesh did his best, and the thing about Rajesh was that he was really committed to quality. Uh, everybody thinks that doing podcasts is easy. You can just switch on your phone and start recording it, which technically is true, but it's not easy doing a good podcast. Um, Rajesh invested in it. You know, he set up a proper sound studio in his office with, like, uh, you know, insulated, uh, sorry, soundproof walls, etc. He got a, the equipment, which again is not expensive, but you have to invest a little bit in equipment and the software for editing the files. Uh, and we got an excellent sound engineer, a wonderful guy called Abdul. Uh, who actually, you know, took care of the of the, the sound of the podcast, and um, you know, so for instance, if you listen to my podcast, you think I'm talking continuously. I'm actually not. Uh, I would do multiple takes for almost every single uh, sentence, and Abdul would painstakingly stitch the whole thing together. Also, my podcasts were fairly well scripted. Um, a lot of the podcasts today, and I'm uh, are just people talking, and that often works, but it's a bit of a risk because you. Yeah, yeah, I'm just it's okay. So Alok is calling me. So I'm going to uh, finish soon. Um, uh, yeah, Alok. So uh, a lot of podcasts today are just people talking, which is which to me is risky because you are depending on the people you're talking to being really interesting, which is really not always the case. Uh, whereas for me, uh, because I'm a journalist, I scripted the podcast. Uh, I like I went with a story with a complete, you know, uh, with a complete flow uh, and and a structure, and everything was sort of tightly edited to that. So. Um, I still think, to be honest, our podcasts are pretty good, even though so many new podcasts are coming out. They're still available on Audible for anybody who wants to hear them. Um, would we get back to them? I mean, Rajesh and I talk about it. We'd like to do it. The problem is monetization. I mean, we just were not able to uh, to, to to make any money just to cover our costs. No, but none of us were, were, were even looking at making money from the podcast, but we were just not able to cover our costs. And you know, this is the hard fact that, you know, you also are, are painfully aware of that you can create great content and you can do it for a certain amount of time. But after a point, if you cannot monetize the content, you cannot continue things indefinitely. So that's the hard, hard, hard truth. Uh, so Priyanka, uh, Peanut, who's Peanut Butter here on screen, Priyanka Borpajare, a journalist friend of mine. Uh, was asking, I think that you've answered that in just in the flow of this. Uh, of what yeah, I, I think so. to just spin multiple stories. You can, you can totally look at multiple stories. You just have to look at the stories behind the stories. I mean, that's all I can say. Uh, Madhu's brief question. Madhu, was, yeah, was where, where I by, no, no, no. Madhu, I mean, give me a break. You're a restaurant person. You know, you know, you you know, like sources of food in in Bangalore better than I do. Um, it's definitely possible to buy desi chicken. Okay, uh, if nothing else, you can go to. There is still a market for desi chicken, you know, even um, in regular markets. I mean, definitely if you go to Russell Market, you'll be able to get desi chicken. But, you know, because a lot of people who actually eat chicken really like desi chicken. People in the, people I've talked to, I've talked to people who actually sell chicken and they hate broiler chicken. People in the chicken industry think broiler chicken is shit because it really is shit. It tastes nothing. People in the people who sell chicken will eat the desi chicken for themselves. You know, they'll have to cook it differently. They'll have to use pressure cooking more. But um, yeah, uh, it's possible to get desi chicken. All right. 
uh, Rushina's question, when you see by the book in yeah, the near future, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Okay, yeah, maybe you ever, someday. Why haven't you done a book? Because I, I'm still filing stories. That's it. That's as simple as that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a conversation with uh, Vatsala, who's here. Who, you know, but I, I met Vats and you at the same time. And we were talking to some other people. And there was a book about food that came out. And Vatsala looked at you accusingly and said, Doc, this is the book you should have been writing. And was, I'm, I'm happy everybody's writing great books on food. I mean, maybe someday. I don't know. All right. Uh, yeah, uh, AB, yes, that was an interesting thing of Bombay Toast. I also knew it only as Bombay Toast before I actually came to Bombay and asked people about Bombay Toast and then discovered that in Bombay they called it French Toast. Yeah. And that they also did savory versions of it, which horrified my Anglo-Indian soul. But uh, as I discovered later, it was just my my family which didn't do savory, uh, you know, French Toast. But yeah, uh, Abhishek is asking about uh, the variations in dosas on the streets of Bombay. Is it exclusively a Bombay phenomenon? Is it, is it linked to the eating habits of the Gujarati businessman? And I mean, that, that, is, that, is, a, that, is, that is a theory uh, that, that you know, Gujarati businessmen are behind a lot of the street food innovations in Bombay. And it's true. I mean, you know, uh, one thing I have to say, I'm half Gujarati, so uh, you know, I don't often acknowledge it. Um, and I have to say the Gujarati community uh, is passionate about food and is great about, uh, is great about inventing ways, new ways to eat food. And dosas actually are a great example of that because I don't know if you've eaten something called a dosa kakra. Okay, dosa kakras um, are an amazing invention. Okay, uh, and you would probably still only get them in Bombay and Surat, uh, but they deserve to be pan Indian. Basically, they're, they're like a, how do I describe it? A dosa kakra, look, Google it. I mean, you can, it's a thin, crisp packaged dosa. It's like a dosa chip. Um, and it was something that was invented uh, apparently from Surat. But um, a lot of people don't understand the real, ingen the real ingenuity in a dosa kakra. Uh, basically, they, one part of it is involved using how to use a dosa sort of mixture and dehydrating it. But the real innovation of dosa kakra, because those chips are very fragile, is developing the plastic box. They always come in a sort of um, square plastic box, which is vital because otherwise you can't, you, they're just going to crumble. So some Gujarati guy, uh, had, you know, A, developed how to do a dehydrated dosa and B, developed the packaging. Packaging is really crucial. People don't often give enough credit to packaging. Um, but packaging innovations of, are often like really dry foods. And, I'll, and one example I can give you from a street food that we're familiar with is a Frankie. Okay, everybody in Bombay is familiar with a Frankie. Okay, and we think it's like, oh, it's a wrap like any other. No, but it's not actually true. A Frankie is slightly different from most other wraps for a very simple reason. And the answer is actually the plastic sleeve uh, that they always come in. Now, the Frankie is one street food which actually does have a fairly credible origin story. It was, uh, there's a guy called Amarjit Tibbs, who, uh, according to the, his family story, was in, uh, was, you know, in the early days before in the uh, flights in the, in the 70s or so, uh, flights to Europe always stopped in Beirut. Um, and so he stopped in Beirut on, on one of the, on a flight, on a, on a BOAC flight or something like that. And he, found shawarma wraps and he loved it. Um, and he decided, I'm going to come back to India and launch a wrap. So he launched a wrap, but he felt, you know, a lot of Indians were like, you know, this is not chatpata enough. Indians like, like, are not really, we don't really, we don't like very dry foods. And the, you know, there's a, dry foods are a much more Middle Eastern piece. We need gravy. Indian foods are all about gravy, whether they come from dal or like, uh, uh, or whether they come from gravy. So we wanted to put some gravy. So Tibbs is, Mr. Tibbs' great innovation was if you create a plastic sleeve, which is closed at one end, you can put in a much more liquidy filling into the wrap. And that is the real innovation with Frankie's. Not that there are hundreds of wraps around the world. The Frankie, as far as I know, is the only wrap which allows you to put in really liquidy filling because of the plastic sleeve. Yeah, that's, right. that's an example of what I meant by how packaging really helps you invent dishes. Okay, and now I think uh, Alok is going to like really kill me if I don't leave soon. Um, so I'm going to like... Uh, I, can I fit in one from Salil Tripathi who sent it sure. to me privately? Uh, Salil, Salil asks, why is it that Gujaratis who are so passionate about food and Gujaratify many cuisines are big patrons of restaurant, drive innovation, etc. Why have they not produced a single well-known master chef? And what are they... And with you know, uh, 
that most cooks in upper caste, upper class Gujarati homes, vegetarian ones, are usually Rajasthani, and many Gujarat Gujarati restaurants in Ahmedabad have Rajasthani cooks. So, so he adds that question: Is there such a thing as Gujarati cuisine? I mean, there is definitely such a thing as, as Gujarati cuisine, and there's actually a lot of Gujarati non-veg cuisine. I mean, we often uh, accept the narrative that that Gujarati food uh, is pure is purely vegetarian, uh, which is not actually true. I mean, there are many Gujarati uh, uh, meat-eating communities, um, uh, and it's just that. I mean, as Salil knows better than me uh, and has written, has written about better than me, uh, Gujaratis are really good at manipulating narratives, uh, as we know from a political level also. Uh, so this idea has grown that, you know, Gujarati food is vegetarian only and uh, things like that. It's not, that, 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 that that's uh, uh, not actually true. Um, Gujarati food is really interesting uh, because, you know, while it's, as I said, there is meat eating, it is dominantly uh, 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 it is dominantly vegetarian. Uh, Gujarat is also, uh, Gujarat is, is again, it's a very cosmopolitan state because we often forget that Gujarat used to be at the end of one, one of one of the sort of southern end of the, of the Silk Route. Uh, the, the, you know, the Silk Route obviously went from China to like Aleppo, but one sort of stream of the Silk Route came down and ended in Surat. Uh, and Surat was this big trading port until the river uh, uh, silted up and the trade, the trade moved to uh, moved to Bombay, bringing a lot of Gujarati merchants uh, uh, with them. But the thing is, so Gujarat again has always had a very cosmopolitan, like Goa in many ways, has been a source where many different ingredients uh, 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 come together. At the same time, uh, Gujarat is linked to a very dry interior, um, so there is a whole range of 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 of, of foods that, that, and it is it's true that you know. Communities where food comes from relatively limited sources are forced to innovate in, in many interesting ways. Um, and so there are many Gujarati foods that are very based on dried vegetables, that are based on, uh, on, on dumplings from gram flour, from, from uh, dal flour, from chichikpi flour, things like that. So, um, uh, so Gujarati food has been forced to be innovative in, in, in many ways. There are also Muslim influences in Gujarati food, you know, which um, I have a book here. Uh, this is this is one of the most amazing Gujarati cookbooks. It's called uh, this. This is it. Uh, Rushina actually, uh, I was the one who told me about it. It's called Dadimano Varso. It is a book from the Gujar Gujarati Palanpuri Jain community, um, and it is incredible. It is truly incredible. Uh, it it is it chronicles the food of the Palanpuri Jains who are a uh, diamond who are diamond uh, who are the diamond trading community. Um, but one of the most interesting parts of this book, actually, and this book was produced by uh, 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 a, tr a truly uh, amazing uh, lady. Uh, it was produced by a bunch of Palanpuri Jain ladies, but under uh, the, the direction of a truly amazing lady called Dr. Satyavati Javeri, uh, who uh, uh, Salil knows very well. And uh, she, uh, I don't know if this is my light is really bad, but if you can see this, picture. This is, this is one of the first pictures in the book. Now, this is a really interesting picture, which uh, Dr. Javeri told me she insisted be part of this book. Because what this picture shows is three people eating from one thali, which is actually very unusual, because it's not something we think of as part of Hindu food, because we have all this idea of juta. It's something we associate with, with Muslim food, because uh, it, it fits the Muslim idea of, of of everybody eating from, from one plate. And the point Dr. Javeri wanted to convey through this illustration is that Palanpur was actually a Muslim state. There was a Nawab of Palanpur. So the, the Palanpuris came from this Muslim state and they have traditions that originally, despite being vegetarian, included eating of uh, one thal. And I remember it's, it's a bit poignant that she told me quietly, like, that, you know, people don't like to talk about it these days. They don't want to admit that we have this Muslim image, but I felt it was important. And so I included this um, uh, uh, illustration. So I, I guess, sorry, my, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really answering uh, 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 Salil's uh, question. Um, I, I, why there is no great Gujarati chef? I'm sure there are great Gujarati chefs. Uh, there are great Gujarati food entrepreneurs. Um, and so, you know, I, whether there's going to be a great chef is sort of irrelevant to me. Uh, Tarla Dalal is an interesting figure. Um, she's actually, uh, people get Tala Dalal wrong, you know, I mean, uh, they think she's a great expert on Gujarati food. She was never a great expert, expert on Gujarati food. She was, um, 
more an expert on, on, on adapting international food to Gujarati tastes. And her really her real successes were, in, uh, really early successes were involved in that. But to me, that's interesting too, that, you know, Gujaratis are uh, willing to adapt foods in all, so, in all sorts of ways. I mean, there are actually great Gujarati cookbooks from outside Gujarat, uh, from, from uh, South Africa. Uh, the, one of these great South African cookbook called, uh, called uh, I've forgotten the, 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 the name now, uh, is actually from the, a Gujarati community who, who were the merchant community in South Africa, Indian Delights, sorry, Indian Delights, that's the name. Um, so there are Gujarati cookbooks from around the world which show the innovation. I mean, Gujaratis are open to influences and also adapting the influences to their own tastes. And that I think is, is what really is the hallmark of Gujarati food. I don't think I've answered Salim's question, but... Uh, yeah. Salim was also, uh, as Madhu points out, uh, trolling there a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, Salim is a provocateur here. But uh, Doc, I'll just ask you one more question and then let you go to your guests. Uh, you talked about blogging. You have experimented with podcasts. You are now on Instagram. So this is kind of related. One, why didn't you get onto that blog bandwagon? One. And now we're seeing with blogging, uh, people like Rashina, uh, now have inspired a bunch of people to come on. Instagram has become this, and it's now become a lot of what is called the influencer culture, where a lot of things get paid. There are people getting paid just to mention names. And, you know, we have to do things when now in this current atmosphere, it's like if I'm going to mention a bottle that I'm quoting that I have to be very specific, I'm not being paid for it. Hey, why didn't you get into blogging? And what do you think about what's happening in this whole influencer culture scenario? How has that, that changed? And you're there on Instagram, which is like influencer home. Peter, I didn't get into blogging because I'm a professional journalist. Okay, so things, to me, things are not real unless they're in print and unless, they're, unless I'm being paid for them. I mean, that is, that is my feeling completely. I mean, uh, okay, um, because obviously if I was better at social media, if I, if I was better at, at, if I was willing to get over this thing, but for me, it's really hard for me. A story is not real unless it's in print and unless I'm being paid for it, um, which is the antithesis of, 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 of social media. So that is, is my feeling. Um, uh, but uh, I, I mean, this is a bit controversial. I, I still value my journalistic experience. And I, I think there is, while I think blogging has been great, I think there are some things blogging can learn from professional journalists like me. And as I said, it's happening today. Because you have online sites like Whetstone and Whittles, which are bringing a little bit more rigor into, uh, into online journalism. Um, one of the problems with going entirely online is there is, there is, there, there is nobody is holding you to, to any standard. And while a lot of bloggers with a lot of fascinating documentation, a lot of mistruths, a lot of like, um, you know, fanciful stories. Food journalism is full of fanciful stories because it's very hard to prove anything because a lot of food was developed by people who were not, whose, who were not, whose words were not being taken seriously. A lot of food is done by women and by servants, uh, including servants who are women, um, who nobody listens to, uh, who are often illiterate. So the, a lot of the innovations in food have never been documented. And unfortunately, that means a lot of half truths, a lot of like random stories develop, and um, uh, uh, and and, and uh, uh, sorry, so Alok is like going to shut the feed any minute. Um, but uh, letting him go right now. <laughs> letting him yeah. go right now. Okay. Um, uh, 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 so so I, I think there hasn't been enough enough rigor in food journalism, and. Uh, I think what is great about sites like Whetstone and Whittles and a lot of people uh, who have become more professional journalists through writing for online media is they're bringing in some of the some of this rigor. All right. So, Doc, what I'm going to ask you to do is yeah. sometime afterwards, since I know you need to go, if you could uh, let us, you know, I mean, who are the food writers in India that you uh, and the food sites that you uh, enjoy? And let's not get into that now because you do have to go, but perhaps you can give that to me in an email and I will share it with people sure. who attended uh, this talk today. But yeah. sites that you recommend, writers that you recommend. I'll do that. I'll send you a mail. Yep. So let's wind this up then. Uh, yeah, we've well, got- Thank you for uh, inviting me to this. Thank you for everybody who on a Sunday night and while there's an England uh, uh, versus Italy final and, and 
Federer versus that Italian. No, sorry, no, sorry, Djokovic versus that Italian whose name nobody can remember. Uh, happening at the same time, you're still listening to this. Thank you for that. There already there's still 41 people. Um, so that's your that's your uh, influence, Peter. That you've got all these people together to listen. So thank you for that. Thank you for this, Doc. And maybe we can persuade you to come on again sometime. Absolutely, chat. definitely. And we'll see you there. Okay. So thanks, everyone Bye. who came in, and thank you, Doki. Bye. See ya.